This is CBC <laughs> Here and Now. The entire weekend was fabulous. I thank many of my colleagues for joining me on the Grand Peninsula. A big event last year to mark a big occasion, Caitlin Osmond's visit home after her Olympic win. But why did the local MHA Mark Brown's office offer a government grant in exchange for free tickets? Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. And I'm Carolyn Stokes. CBC News has learned that a liberal MHA's office offered a $1,500 grant to a local skating club in Marystown last year to secure 34 complimentary tickets for Caitlin Osmond's ice show. Now at the time, Osmond's homecoming was the biggest event in the province and those tickets went to Premier Dwight Ball, several cabinet ministers and other liberal politicians. Now Here and Now has learned about this ticket deal through some emails that uh, we've managed to acquire and these emails, which I'm going to try to walk you through and we'll quote for you in just a bit. They indicate that the politicians got their free tickets after local MHA Mark Brown offered a government grant to the Ice Crystals. Now that's the Marystown Club for Young Figure Skaters. They hosted the sold out Caitlin Osmond event at that same arena that bears her name. And the media in this province, including us, well, we descended on Marystown in droves. It was the hottest event in the province, a jammed arena, standing room only, the toughest ticket in town. That's Mark Brown, the MHA for Placentia West Bellevue, standing next to Premier Dwight Ball and other Liberal cabinet ministers and MHAs, front row, center ice, the best seats in the house. In early March, a month before the Caitlin Osmond show, Mark Brown's assistant, Tara Plank, emailed the Ice Crystals Skating Club. Brown's assistant wrote, As per our telephone conversation this afternoon, the provincial government is looking for 30 tickets to the ice show. And the Liberal assistant mentioned this incentive. Like I said earlier, there will be some monetary donations being given to the Ice Crystals Figure Skating Club from the government. The email also asked for four more tickets, bringing the total to 34. It also included a list of the VIPs as well as the number of tickets for each one. Mark Brown, three tickets. Dwight Ball, three tickets. MHA Carol Ann Haley, two tickets, and so on. Cabinet Ministers Sherry Gambin Walsh, Lisa Dempster, and Al Hawkins also included on the freebie list. Some Liberals named on that list chose not to attend. So let's follow the money. The Osmond Ice Show tickets were $20 a piece, so you multiply that by the request for $34. That's a total cost to the club of $680 to dole out the tickets to the politicians. The Ice Crystals got that grant that Brown's assistant promised. That was $1,500. So you take that minus the cost of the politicians' tickets, and that left $820 for the club. But it meant 34 fewer tickets for the skaters to sell to their family members and supporters. And in that second email, Mark Brown's assistant explained the benefit of the $1,500 grant. She wrote, With the extra funds that we can secure for the club, the granting of these tickets will be more than covered from a monetary perspective. Mr. Speaker, the best way is the Osmond way, and what a weekend it has been. A raucous airport arrival, a celebratory Olympic event here at Confederation Building, culminating in a hometown celebrations where literally thousands of people came out to meet Caitlin, celebrate her accomplishments, and watch her skate on her home ice. The entire weekend was fabulous. I thank many of my colleagues for joining me on the Grand Peninsula. Mark Brown proudly calls himself Caitlin Osmond's biggest fan and frequently rises in the house to boast about Caitlin's achievements. Well, the skating club says it never asked for $1,500, something that Mr. Brown disagrees with. And I spoke with him this morning and asked him for his side of the story. In a statement, Mr. Brown says he did nothing wrong, that he was delighted. So many of his colleagues joined him at the Caitlin Osmond Arena. And in a statement, he writes, The Premier gave me clear direction last spring to purchase tickets rather for the event. The tickets used by me and my guests were purchased. No free tickets were used. And he says he's disappointed that this news report will take away from the good work of the Ice Crystals Figure Skating Club. And he concludes, I have done nothing wrong and I will not be distracted from the issues of importance to those I am working hard to continue representing. Well, is this story merely a question of bad optics or does it raise deeper issues about politicians and benefits? We'll tackle that later with MUN political scientist Kelly Bladuk.
if what underlies that is in fact a government grant that in turn is supposed to then benefit specific people, then that's pretty clearly wrong. When you're governing, you can't give out money with an understanding that you get any right. benefit back from it, right? And that's still kind of the, the issue or the story that we're concerned about here. Now we're going to come back to the story later on Here and Now and bring you my full interview with Professor Bladuk. Stupid newfies! In good fun, I think. You just need to have a thick skin, to be honest. A Simpsons episode set in Canada takes a big jab at people from this province. Just ahead, Jeremy Eaton has reaction from people here and how one business is hoping to cash in. You in Canada, where you'll be safe and assigned your own hockey team. Back to the election now, once the Simpsons are done. It was a big day for the Liberal Party in this election campaign. The party unveiled the Red Book, its book of promises, if the party should form the next government. But there's little new information in this Red Book. Here now is Katie Breen was there for the launch, and she'll walk us through the announcements. Katie. Well, today was basically budget 2019 over again. Not much in the way of new promises. The Red Book was really just the party repeating its existing plan with a couple extras. We are working together and letting people of this province know that we do have a plan. The plan? To stick to the plan. The Liberals came out with the way forward two and a half years ago, a seven-year strategy to rein in spending and return the province to surplus. We are sticking to the plan because we're getting proven results. The platform released today was mostly things announced before, things in the provincial budget like building a new HMP and Waterford and removing the car insurance tax Liberals brought in in 2016. The party was widely criticized back then for campaigning on promises it didn't keep when elected into power. Ball says he was caught off guard by the province's finances then and knows better now. Well, it's about sustainability. And when you make commitments to people, you make commitments to Newfoundland and Labrador, is that you can do it and it can be paid for. Of the 23 points highlighted today, one was new, two were older but expanded. Under the Liberals, Buren and Botwood would receive more supports to keep seniors in their homes, expanding a program that started in 2017. More CNA programs would be developed for specific regions, like an aircraft maintenance program in Gander and aquaculture in Grand Falls, Windsor. The new, new announcement is a province-wide radio system that would let first responders like paramedics and police communicate with each other. Uh, it's a communication network where people can cooperate and have access to real-time information. You know, we've seen accidents in this province right now with this kind of uh, platform in place probably could have been prevented. And so it's important for us to make this investment. It's outdated and some of the programs cannot even be supported anymore. So this would be a multi-year project. No timeline or cost was given, but more towers would have to be built. And the party says a side benefit of that would be better cell service in the province. Live in the newsroom, I'm Katie Breen for Here and Now. And as the Liberals launched their Red Book today, the Progressive Conservatives have responded with a promise of their own. They're pledging to one-up the Liberal Party's commitments on insurance taxes. Here and Now's Garrett Berry is live with us tonight. So Garrett, uh, what are the PCs promising? Well, it's almost like a classic case of anything you can do, I can do better. Chess Crosby saw Dwight Ball's promise to repeal the tax on automobile insurance and raised a promise of his own, saying he was going to remove the tax on homeowners insurance if he gets elected. He was hammering away on the last Liberal budget. Which was used as an election platform campaign piece, not as a serious budget. When? By the way, our plan is to take the insurance tax off all insurance, not just auto, so homeowner included. He says that change is ready right away, but the numbers, you'll have to wait and see. Correct. That'll be done in our first budget. Have you, have you done the math on that? What would it cost uh, the Treasury and how would you make up for that lost revenue? Sure, we've, do we've done the math and you'll be able to sharpen your pencil and go through it yourself tomorrow when we release the book. So what would that mean for you? Sure. Well, in, in St. John's, uh, we know in 2018 that on average the quoted uh, premium was about $1,585. Do the math. The tax on that, about $230. But if you'll gain, the government wallet loses. And the Liberal leader says government can't afford it. He's now splashing money around. I see right now an extra $20 million or so 
that would bring next year's deficit up to $800 million plus. So therefore, he's got some massive cuts that he's planning by the sounds of things. So There's not much new in this debate. After all, Premier Danny Williams repealed this tax in 2008. Eight years later, the Ball government brought it back, citing hard financial times. Now, Crosby says he's going to tell reporters how he plans to pay for all this tomorrow when he and his party release the Tory blue book of election promises. Garrett Berry, CBC News, St. John's. Well, depending on where you were across the island and province today, really, uh, depending whether you saw rain or snow. So uh, earlier today, those temperatures actually for the island or for the Avalon, rather 10 degrees when you woke up. Temperatures steadily declined as we headed through the afternoon. And we can thank a cold front for that. And then in behind that, we're seeing snow along the west coast. Rain right now along the northeast coast and the Avalon starting to see reports of this already changing over to snow. And that's because because as that cold front moves away, we've got uh, cooler air moving in behind it, which means snow overnight tonight and even the risk of some snow squalls. Yes, it is the end of April, but we're in a snow squall setup. So I'll have all those details in your full forecast coming up. Thanks, Ashley. Well, there are questions in Rigolette tonight about where people will get fuel once the town's only gas station shuts down. Right now, the business is run by the town, but the local council says it's racking up a lot of debt and can no longer afford to be in the gas station business. It's expected the tanks will run dry in a few weeks, and the town says when that happens, they won't be refilled. We've had loans from the Nazi government, but as far as that, they just want their money back, and that's piling on top of the bills that we already have. Our town is 100% going to suffer if we continue down this path. We've been advised by our financial department that if we keep going this way, we will be bankrupt. A mother in St. John's who was facing an immigration nightmare will be allowed to travel with her son after all. Sajia Yakubi's 16-month-old son, Elias, needs special treatment to fight brain cancer. He needs a treatment that is available in the United States, but not Canada. And it's been a month since CBC News first reported Yakubi was unable to travel to Boston because she didn't qualify for a passport. Now, she moved here five years ago from Afghanistan, and since her story became public, she has seen an outpouring of support on both sides of the border, and Member of Parliament Nick Whalen helped speed up the visa process. She spoke with CBC News through her husband, Asadullah Fakiri. She says, my best wishes, you know, all the people, as even she says, if I was in, inside my country, I wouldn't get that, that kind of, you know, treatment or that kind of hospitality like that's the best kind you know the best well now to some local sports news the newfoundland growlers split the first two games in their playoff series against the manchester monarchs over the weekend on friday at mile one center the growlers gave up two quick goals in the third period ending in a 3-2 loss but newfoundland struck back with a 4-2 win at home on saturday the north division finals are now tied at a game apiece with the two teams facing off in game three of the best of seven series tomorrow in manchester I'm sure you treat all peoples equally. Except the Quebecois. And the Newfies. Stupid Newfies! I'm a Newfie! Whee! This Canada-themed episode of The Simpsons has some people in this province calling for Homer's head. Now, the moment took center stage on social media last night, just minutes after the show aired. Here now is Jeremy Eaton has been following the fallout uh, today. So, Jeremy, what are people saying about this? Would you believe it that people got upset by this? Uh, <laughs> yeah. So there hasn't been a lot of positive reaction. There was a huge uproar on social media about how, and people haven't been up this set about how this province has been portrayed since 2005. And you may remember that's when Globe and Mail columnist Margaret Wente called us a vast and scenic welfare ghetto. But this time the insults were animated and with the popular cartoon slinging two stereotypes in a matter of seconds. Newfoundlanders and Labradorians love nothing more than seeing our little province on the screen until you make fun of us. Last night the Simpsons went for laughs, but did they land with the locals? Okay, but I'm sure you treat all peoples equally. Except the Quebecois. 
and the Newfies. Stupid Newfies! So, in the episode, they call Newfoundlanders stupid Newfies. Is somebody from this province, does that upset you at all? I think it's like dumb because obviously they shouldn't be making fun of us because we're not stupid. I didn't mind it. They roast everyone. They've been roasting everyone for years. It's just in good fun, I think. I don't think we should take it too personally. No, we've been referred to as stupid, stupid Newfies the whole time. You just need to have a thick skin, to be honest. I was more offended about all this as a comedian rather than a Newfoundlander because they took a, such a dated stereotype. That stereotype is, you know, we lost that in the 90s pretty much. It's kind of like me breaking out Monica Lewinsky material. It's not the first time The Simpsons has taken a shot at this province and the seal hunt. Back in 2013, Simpsons co-creators Sam Simon and Pamela Anderson came to town, offering a million dollar check for people to stop sealing, which led local comedian Mark Critch to make an offer of his own. I have a check here, a, a check, a real check, for a million dollars for Pamela Anderson to stop acting. We've seen the horrible videos. It's also not the first time Always in Vogue has stood up for the seal hunt. Owner Darren Halloran didn't love the Simpsons treatment. First thing I didn't like, it was it was a young pup. Uh, the other thing was they were clubbing it. Um, you haven't been able to club seals in a long, long time, and we haven't been able to kill baby seals since 1987, so it was misportrayed. To combat the misconceptions created by the show, he's offering a month-long sale. We know we have great support from Newfoundland and Labrador and as well as across Canada. We sell products all over Canada and it's something that we're going to continue to do, but we're not going to let a show like The Simpsons scare us away from doing what we do. So you may recall that Margaret Wente later paid a visit to Newfoundland and Labrador and she apologized. It's highly unlikely that the staff of The Simpsons will do the same, but CBC did reach out to the show's creator, but believe it or not, we never heard back. Now as for comedian Mark Critch, Believe it or not, but he was quick to chime in on this as well. And here's what he had to say on Twitter last night. I'm not upset about the Newfie joke on the Simpsons episode so much as am surprised that in all my 45 years, the lamest, least interesting Newfie joke <laughs> I've heard was on the Simpsons. Yeah, he's got a point there. Not a, lot, not a big score for originality for <laughs> no, us. Oh, certainly right? not. I mean, they're known for being clever, but it's kind of... Now, low, low hanging stupid fruit, right? When I asked everybody on the street, I said, did you watch the show? And they said, no, I, like everybody else, was watching Game of Thrones. <laughs> so right. there, you, there you have yeah. it. And we've yet to make an appearance on that show. Right? Probably won't. All right, we'll see what happens. Thanks, Jeremy. No problem. Thanks. Nobody should have to sacrifice their quality of life, how long they're going to live, because it's too expensive. Problems with the government's insulin pump program. A young type 1 diabetic fears many will be left behind. Details coming up.
the best thinkers, the brightest minds, those on the forefront of making the province a better place. From April 29th to May 3rd, CBCNL is celebrating Innovation Week in Newfoundland and Labrador. Join us as we talk to the startups, the game changers, and business mavericks who are creating opportunities and driving innovation right here. To find out more about Innovation Week and how you can get involved, visit innovationweek.ca. This weather update is brought to you by the Healthcare Foundation Home Lottery. Order your tickets now at hcfhomelottery.ca. Gorgeous day it was a great excuse to walk to the library to return an overdue book. So <laughs> how overdue? Uh, after the show, Carolyn. After <laughs> the show, but it was just what a beautiful day. It was so nice. My yeah. goodness. I hope I, you got out. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was definitely a day to go for a walk for sure. If you were on the Avalon, yeah, oh, that's right. pretty right. much the only place that uh, was warm-ish this morning. Uh, but those temperatures, if you've been out any time recently, have dropped uh, quite significantly. If we take a look at those temperatures right now, sitting at 4 degrees for St. John's. And then uh, one in Badger. Corner Brook's not rec uh, reporting right now, but or rather, yeah, Cornerbrook's not reporting right now, but you can imagine those temperatures are sitting near or below zero uh, and will continue to drop as we head through the night tonight. Now, we can thank that cold front, as I mentioned a little bit earlier. The low is spinning just uh, north of the Great Northern Peninsula, and then we've got the cold front pushing offshore right now. The low is going to stick with us for at least a couple of days. So we're going to continue to see some snow with this system as we wrap around that colder air. So we can already see that on the satellite and radar. Uh, the rain now has tapered off and is tapering actually to flurries as we head through the overnight tonight. We can see that as that uh, we look at the future tracker. Uh, overnight, we're going to start to see that snow squall potential develop along the west coast and then up through Labrador. Uh, temperatures now are going to be hovering between 2 and 3 degrees tomorrow afternoon, which means uh, we're either going to see rain or snow through the day. So as we head through the overnight, though, those temperatures are going to dip. So about uh, minus 2 to minus 4 across the board with that rain, as I mentioned, changing over to the potential for some flurries likely won't accumulate too much uh, along the west coast or along the northeast coast. Rather, the west coast, yes, you're going to see uh, quite a bit of snowfall through the overnight tonight. About 2 to 4 centimeters is what I mean by quite a bit. Otherwise, Flurries up through Labrador, minus 12 for Lab City, and then zero for Happy Valley Goose Bay. Along the coast, we could see some freezing drizzle or freezing rain uh, before that changes over to flurry. So here's a look at that system. It's now going to be off the coast through the day tomorrow and in behind it where those temperatures are flirting above zero is why we're going to see that uh, potential to change over to rain or at least mix with rain through the afternoon. Same for the northern peninsula as well. Otherwise, along the west coast, south coast, even the southern Avalon, we could see that risk of some uh, snow squalls through the day and then wrap in that colder air again. And it looks like the coast of Labrador will see quite a bit of snow. So here's what uh, the models are showing right now. You can see in the higher elevations along the west coast significant amounts of snow. So between 15 to 20 centimeters is possible. Otherwise, 5 to 15 is a good bet in some of these squalls. And then up through the Labrador coast as well. Into uh, This takes us through to tomorrow afternoon. If we go ahead a little bit more, those uh, accumulations will be closer to 10 to 15 along the coast. So here's your temperatures for tomorrow. Much cooler than what we saw today, hovering around 1 or 0 degrees for the most part. Those winds are also going to be quite strong, so gusting upwards of about 70 kilometers per hour out of the west. So if we do see some snow, it will be blowing snow as well. Grand Falls winds are 2 degrees, and then as we head towards the coast, that's where uh, those temperatures will likely be below 0 tomorrow. Onshore winds uh, with reduced visibility in the squalls through the afternoon up through the northern peninsula again going to see that potential to change over to rain those temperatures a little bit warmer between three and four degrees and that's the case up through the coast as well and then as we head towards western labrador uh, a lot uh, cooler so minus five you're going to see mainly snow tomorrow about two to five centimeters as possible and northern nain as well or around nain as well around two degrees so let's look at your forecast i'll have a, a look ahead when i come back
Well, now back to election news. A St. John's woman who lost coverage for her insulin pump says a recent promise by the Liberals doesn't go far enough. Alana Green fears government's policy will have dire consequences for type 1 diabetics who are still excluded from the insulin pump program. Here now's Mark Quinn has that story. I use this to put insulin in the pump. Alana Green was one of the first people in Newfoundland and Labrador to get provincial funding for an insulin pump. She was 14 at the time and had been injecting insulin for almost a decade. It was phenomenal. Like, it brings you a higher level of care. You're able to care for your um, diabetes so much better. Diabetics using needles are more likely to have complications, such as kidney failure, blindness and amputations. In this province, type 1 diabetics receive funding for pumps if they're under the age of 25. I was dreading. I was absolutely dreading turning 25. But of course, it did happen, and so last year, 26-year-old Green paid $7,000 of her own money for a pump. On top of that, supplies are about $500 per month. There's food, there's a house, there's heat, and there's my pump. Like, those are the essentials. In this spring's budget, Health Minister John Hagee promised some diabetics won't have to face that decision. Uh, so what we will be doing is for people who are currently on the insulin pump program, uh, they will not age out. But he also said money is tight and the province can't help those who've already aged out of the program. It's devastating for the, those of us who are over the age of 25. PC leader Chess Crosby says his party is going further. He says the PCs would remove the age cap altogether and cover pumps for all diabetics in this province. Well, we're talking about a comparatively small amount of money and a total budget of over $8 billion. Here we're talking about, I think it's 2 or $3 million. And it has a huge impact on the people who are concerned. Other parts of the country, such as Ontario, already do what Crosby is proposing. Green fears that unless Newfoundland and Labrador follows suit, there will be another unintended consequence. And so I know diabetics who have looked at leaving just because they feel they have no choice. Critics like Green wonder if the province isn't convinced that pumps are the best solution for controlling health complications and keeping the budget costs of diabetes down, then why does it fund them at all? Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. When you're governing, you can't give out money with an understanding that you get any right. benefit back from it. We return to tonight's top story. The Liberal government gave a grant to a skating club to secure tickets to a major event. Are those two things linked? A political scientist weighs in.
campaign 2019 is at the halfway point, and it's time to find out where the parties stand on the issues. On Wednesday, May 1st, the leaders of the three main parties face off in the 2019 media debate. Journalists from CBC, NTV and The Telegram will push the leaders on a variety of issues. The debate starts at 7 o'clock. You can watch live on CBC TV, online and CBC Radio. The 2019 media debate, Wednesday, 7 o'clock, 6.30 in Labrador. Welcome back to Here and Now. Now to our top story, free tickets requests for Liberal politicians. As you saw earlier on Here and Now, some emails that we have obtained raise questions about how Liberal politicians secured more than 30 tickets for last April's big event, the Caitlin Osmond Ice Show in Marystown. Political scientist Kelly Bluduk joins me now and uh, thank you for coming in to offer your analysis on this story. Thanks for having me. All right, right off the bat, let's take a look at this first email, uh, which was sent in early March. This from MHA Mark Brown's assistant, Tara Plank. In that email, she writes, as per our telephone conversation this afternoon, the provincial government is looking for 30 tickets to the ice show. And like I said earlier, there will be some monetary donations from the government. So on the face of it, Professor Bladuk, what do you make of this? So there's not a lot there, but it does look like the initial sort of bargain is we'd like something from you, but we're going to give you something sort of bigger and then you can, uh, you know, sort of feed it back to us. Right. Um, if what underlies that is in fact a government grant that in turn is supposed to then benefit specific people, then that's pretty clearly wrong. All right. Um, I don't know that you could say 100% from just that email that that's what transpired. Um, but that's the direction that it seems to go, sort of like government will be giving you money, but then there's, there's certain people that we want to also get something from that. Okay, well, let's consider a second email. Now, in this email, it refers to a $1,500 grant, and Ms. Plank writes, with the extra funds that we can secure for the club, the granting of the tickets will be more than covered from a monetary perspective. So I see that granting of the tickets, uh, Kelly Bladuk, and I, it raises questions for me. What are your thoughts about it? Yeah, so, so this looks like a government grant is being given, and in turn we want some, some portion of what that grant is buying or what that grant is covering. Uh, again, so anytime you're looking at government, what you can't have is a situation where the people who can be making the decisions can also benefit from those decisions. Any version of that is a conflict of interest. And you could, I mean, we're talking about what is probably a relatively small amount of money yep. here, and I wouldn't want to sort of inflate this, to, but if we think back to like the liberal sponsorship scandal at the federal level or, you know, that was huge. But, but what underlied that, what was underneath all that was kind of the same principle that we're concerned about here, which is ultimately that when you're governing, you can't can't give out money with an understanding that you get any right. benefit back from it, right? And that's still kind of the, the issue or the story that we're concerned about here. And what about the optics of this? Because I think most reasonable people watching tonight would say, I have no problem with the Premier and Liberal politicians going to see this, this marquee event with Caitlin Osmond coming home, but why not just make it very upfront, maybe invite other MHAs, pay for the tickets with your own money and away you go? I think that would absolutely be what you would, you would want. But again, you're going back to specifically how this transpired would not be acceptable, right? So most people would not have a problem with these politicians being there. They may not even really mind if there was some kind of a transparent process by which the government paid for certain VIPs or certain dignitaries, whatever, to, to have attended it. Right. But that's not what happened. What happened in this case, again, sort of specifically, or what appears to have happened, was that a grant was given where some of it was meant to come back as a benefit. So you have people making decisions to spend a set amount of money, but making decisions that in turn then will still Still kind of come back and help them right. and if it's true that these all went just to members of the Liberal Party I think that's one sort of extra step where people would look and say okay so this wasn't just about making sure dignitaries could attend or sort of spreading the money out to something that most people would see as beneficial uh, this went to a set of people who will get to show their faces at the event that's a benefit to them but also just attending the event right. so there's a there's a party component to this okay. that uh, I think would concern people Professor Bluduk always appreciate your thoughts on this thank you very much all right thank you at first, they were looking at me like I was cracked, but honestly, they accept me like a little sister. Creating football fans. But will the contact sport catch on here? A group for Nova Scotia hopes so. That's coming up.
Welcome back to Here and Now. It's far from the most popular sport in this province, but football is certainly growing. Now, unlike many other places in Atlantic Canada, there's absolutely no high school or university football here, but some people are trying to change that, and so this weekend they brought in some help from Nova Scotia. Here now is Jeremy Eaton. Stop by to check it out. So today we've reached out to St. FX University uh, to come down and, uh, and I guess help us uh, create a new product for our kids. So uh, the guys were nice enough to come down, donate their time and uh, help us develop our children and hopefully increase enrollment. I never did play like a lot of hockey or a lot of other sports growing up. I couldn't really find anything I could really connect to. But when football came up, it was so different for everyone and it was just so different like with you know, the contact of it and all that stuff. I was just really interested in it, so I wanted to try it. Back in 2017, I had the option to go away to Nova Scotia to participate in a maritime combine, which is where the, a bunch of high school students get together and test their skills in front of many university coaches. I did okay in that, and then I started looking around for schools in post-secondary, and Holland College came up, and I got in contact with a former head coach there, and he said, you know, we'd like to see someone from Newfoundland come up. So I sent away a bit of stuff and including film and stuff, and he liked it, and he just got back to me and said, yeah, we're going to sign you. Ready? I like the contact, and I like the feel accepted. I, I, you don't see girls playing football, so when I'm here on the field, the guys don't look at me and be like, okay, go easy, she's a girl. They go hard, they let their hearts out on the field, and it makes me feel good because I'm, they're not only just trying not to hurt me, but they're also playing their heart out. Now they're supportive about it. At first, they were looking at me like I was cracked, honestly. They were looking at me as if you're going to get killed, you're not going to, everyone's just going to like hurt you, you're not going to have fun, but honestly, they accept me like a little sister. Ready, go. I think that it's not that foreign for these kids because like the coaches here are amazing like they're so they love the game so much more than I was expecting and everybody here I mean I know we're in like this is all the football there is but all these people just care about it so much it's awesome it's a lot of fun it's a lot of fun giving these players because they're so enthusiastic because they haven't been around coaching like us before and then giving these coaches tips too like i had coaches coming up all of a session asking me questions and asking me you know why do you do this how, how can we make this better so it's just been a lot of fun well, turning now to national news, Toyota says it will start making two more types of cars in Canada. And the announcement was made today with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau in attendance. It really is such a pleasure to be here to celebrate as Toyota reaffirms its long-term commitment to Canada with a significant investment worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Trudeau credited Toyota's new project in Cambridge, Ontario to the federal government's investment last year of $110 million. Starting in 2022, the plant will begin making a Lexus luxury crossover as well as the hybrid edition of the vehicle. No new jobs were announced today, but it comes at a time when GM and Chrysler are closing some of their operations in Oshawa and Windsor, Ontario. A tough reception today for Boeing's CEO. He addressed shareholders in the company's first general meeting since two fatal crashes of its 737 MAX jets. It's really important that we all focus on letting the investigation process run its due course. Our job is to focus on safety, not on speculation. Well, the company says it's close to completing an upgrade to flight software, but Boeing still has a lot of work to rebuild trust with airlines as well as travelers. It's facing multiple lawsuits as well. The most recent was filed today in Chicago by lawyers representing 10 Canadian victims in March's Ethiopian, Air, Ethiopian rather, airlines crash. All 157 people on board that plane were killed. Well, across the pond, excitement is building for the arrival of the latest royal baby. Bookies are taking bets on the baby's gender and name. And while the birth is already making news, many expect Prince Harry and Meghan will be keeping the details private. CBC's Renee Filipponi has more. The anticipation is growing with media and royal watchers all looking for a sign the baby could be on the way. A note from Buckingham Palace earlier this month said official notice would go out when the Duchess of Sussex goes into labor. Once that happens, media will rush to Windsor where the couple now live 
to wait on details about the new royal. Yesterday, Prince Harry made an appearance at the London Marathon, which has led some to believe the birth isn't imminent. He had always planned to go, but there was no official announcement because if Meghan went into labor, he would have had to cancel. A number of American news outlets are already in Windsor covering the lead up to the birth, but there are still a lot of unknowns, including where she will deliver the baby. There's speculation it could be at home, but it also could be at a hospital in Windsor. Harry and Meghan have chosen to make this private. Unlike Kate and William, the couple will not be bringing the baby out for a public photo op, which isn't sitting well with some of the press here who have been reporting about rifts and tension in the royal family. I'm not so sure that was the greatest of moves in terms of the whole perception and popularity. But on the other hand, this is a very private event. Yeah. She's allowed to do what she wants exactly. after having a baby. Mm -hmm. But it has definitely alienated the press. I think she could have given them like their two minutes and got into a car it would have been a better karma at this particular moment. After the baby is born, the couple says they will take some private time and then at some point, possibly days later, photos and videos will be taken in a private setting and made public. This lack of information about the new royal, seventh in line to the throne, hasn't stopped people betting on all the details, including its name. The front runner right now is Diana. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, London. And across the Commonwealth, there are mixed feelings about Prince Harry and Meghan keeping the details of the birth more private than other royals. Here's a sampling of what tourists at Buckingham Palace think. Maybe just a sign of the times. Uh, I think she's trying to be uh, with the people a bit. So, yeah, maybe that's, that's fine. Yeah. Since he's, he's got married to her, he should, they should be open. He's, uh, they're going against the protocol, isn't it? I think they should do what works for them, you know. And uh, I can see Kate and William ha have to probably do things differently because of his position in line for the throne, right? So, you know, you know they're having their first baby. They should have it however they want. <laughs> yeah. Reasonable advice. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think it's up to the couple in the end. <laughs>
Nasty weather okay. coming. Winter yeah. weather, yeah. yeah. No, it's true. If we take a look at uh, the current temperatures, I showed you, uh, you know, especially uh, along the Avalon now, it's starting to drop two degrees now in St. John's. But take a look at Toronto's temperature, four degrees. We're not the only ones uh, with that potential to see some snow over the next little bit. Uh, and we can see the system will eventually make its way our way, which is going to bring us uh, some rain through the weekend. Uh, or rather the next system to move in uh, to bring in the weather. But this is what we're expecting for tomorrow or Wednesday. Rather, we're going to see that snow continue. So that low is going to continue to track off uh, just off the coast. And then in behind that, we're going to see those northwesterly winds, which is going to bring that snow along the coast and then uh, the potential to see the uh, snow squalls along the west coast. Now, as we head through the day on Wednesday, those temperatures are going to climb a little bit, so we should see a change over to rain potential, especially for the northern peninsula uh, and then for the northeast coast as well. Going to continue to hang on to that potential for snow along the uh, Labrador coast, and that will continue right through Thursday. That system really isn't moving much. So here's a look at the temperatures for Wednesday. So you're going to see a little bit climbing uh, for the Avalon. You can see seven degrees for St. John's. Now along the south coast, we should see plenty of sunshine because uh, what's being affected is offshore. And then again, uh, temperatures climbing a little bit. So two degrees for Corner Brook, three for Happy Valley Goose Bay, which is why it's either rain or snow through the afternoon. Lab City will stay quite chilly at minus one below zero. So we're going to see that stay as snow. Now looking ahead, here's that rain I was talking about that's going to move in. Uh, now that's the low pressure system through Thursday, still going to hang around. So it's not moving much. And then we're going to continue to see that snow along the coastal Labrador move even closer towards uh, the island. So we're going to see along the northeast coast again into Friday, uh, either rain or snow, depending on the temperature through the day, and then continue to uh, hang around into Friday. Generally going to see some clearing finally into Saturday, which is certainly good news. And then that next system will move in and bring that rain potential likely into uh, Saturday evening and Sunday. So here's a, a look at the forecast. One degree tomorrow and then we'll finally start to see uh, those temperatures climb back up. Windy conditions though uh, for Friday again, either rain or snow, but those temperatures will be sitting in the mid single digits. Now for central Newfoundland flurries and windy tomorrow. And then uh, between five and seven degrees through Friday, Saturday, sunshine and should reach a high near 12 degrees there. And then for Western Newfoundland, uh, squall potential again along the coast. Westerly winds gusting upwards of 60 kilometers per hour. So in those squalls, look for reduced visibility. Six degrees by uh, Thursday and then Friday peaks of sun and seven degrees. Saturday should be lovely at 11 with uh, that rain moving in late day. Up through eastern Labrador, temperatures should be above zero right through the end of the uh, week. Saturday, sunshine and seven degrees. And then we're looking at western Labrador, northwesterlies tomorrow uh, and cool. You can see minus one uh, right through Wednesday and then eventually climbing back up to zero. Looks like Saturday we should see some more snow and four degrees. So we've been talking about how uh, we've got Thousands of people in central and eastern Canada are facing several more days of severe flooding. So with the worst of it in a Montreal suburb of St. Mart sur -la Lac. Water broke through a natural dike over the weekend, putting more than a third of the city underwater. 5,000 people were forced to leave with less than an hour's notice. Another 1,500 were told to evacuate their homes the following day. In Gatineau, the Ottawa River is at record high levels. So moving to New Brunswick, emergency crews are working closely with the military. About 200 soldiers are helping flood prevention and cleanup and the Minister of National Defence in St. John today. My uh, guidance has always been is we're quick to arrive and slow to leave to making sure that we are there at that time of need. But when, when we're not needed, um, that, that decision is made in conjunction uh, with, the, uh, with, the, with the province. The minister also says the province won't have to pay for the military help. They expect the flood to decrease fairly quickly and not be as destructive as it was last year. Many families should be able to return to their homes as early as tonight.
pretty yeah, bad. It is, my goodness. Yeah. Uh, well, a group of waterlogged dads in Manitoba are making a splash at the pool. They wanted to support their daughter's swim team. And they're finding out that synchronized swimming is a lot harder than it looks. CBC's Marjorie Dowhaus has more. Meet Manitoba's only all-male synchronized swimming team. The team was created after Christian Goslin wanted to find a way to help raise money for his daughter's synchro team. It started as a kind of a funny idea with friends and we, uh, I was talking about it with my wife the next day. His wife encouraged him to do it. That's when Goslin started recruiting the dads of other swimmers. I was surprised. Um, I did send out an email to all the families of the club and uh, within a couple days I had four or five people. Now there are 11 men on the team. They practice once a week for 90 minutes. The goal is to have a one and a half minute routine. Goslin says he didn't realize how tough it was until he got in the pool. We, we kind of see our daughters do this every day and you have a kind of perception of how hard it could be. But then when you actually get in the water and start trying to put the nose clips on, getting upside down, trying to stay above water, as soon as you have a limb go out of the water, it's very difficult. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The team is not only raising money for the club, but they've also brought attention to the sport. Goslin says the experience has been fun and has created a special bond. A lot of the, the moms would get together because uh, they're the ones primarily bringing the kids to, to, to the sport. And the fact that we, we're getting to know each other as dads, it, it's, it's fantastic. The team will debut its routine at the Pan Am Pool on May 25th to mark Aquatica's 10-year anniversary. Marjorie Dowhouse, CBC News, Winnipeg. It's a lot harder than it looks. Finally, some sexual <laughs> equality in that sport has been missing for years. <laughs> Certainly not as graceful as we're used to seeing. Yeah, pretty good, though. Yeah, pretty good. Yeah. Well, we're uh, Ooh. in full, sweet, uh, full swing for uh, iceberg season. Here's one photo that was taken and sent to us. Wow. Massive. Gorgeous, yeah. I'll tell you where this photo was taken when we come back. Okay, we'll go for the obvious places. North Northern Straits. Peninsula? Northern Peninsula, yeah. We'll see. <laughs> we will. Okay, so we're going to wind the show down with a beautiful 
photo. Yeah, I'm very excited because now it's iceberg season. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, here's the beautiful shot that was taken. And this photo was actually taken for our On the Grey Islands. Okay, it was pretty close. Yeah. So it's coming in around there. You're very close. Now, to I know that you have a pi you're a pilot. Have you, can you operate a drone <laughs> yet? I have never tried. Right, because uh, one of the things that, uh, you'll see every now and then around different parts of the icebergs, you'll see some people out there with their drones, mm. and the footage, as you can imagine, is incredible. of the drone going in and around oh, the icebergs. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I can't wait for that season, because more and more people have these drones. Yeah. And if we're really nice, Quite sometimes they send us their video. They get some video, <laughs> yeah. There's some pretty stunning uh, icebergs that I've seen so far. We've been getting some really lovely pictures. Twitter uh, full of pictures. But uh, this one was sent in by Nadine Newhook. So thank you so much for sending that photo in. And if you want to send us any of your photos, yep. send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca and we'll see them there. Absolutely. So keep Gorgeous. sending them. Mm -hmm. uh, don't forget also political debate this Wednesday, 7 p.m., uh, really on television across the province. And that's uh, Wednesday at 7 p.m. Island time. Here we go. Yeah, so this is uh, it for us on a Monday. Yeah. And, uh, here we go. Here Good we night. go. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Good night.